need to take action. Americans, we are tired of this bullshit. We are tired of the garbage we are seeing everywhere. So let me tell you something weird I observed today. So after the Trump assassination attempt, then immediately I saw Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk uh, said that he has endorsed Donald Trump for the presidency in light of the happenings of today. And I, I was like, can you imagine if a businessman in Kenya tried endorsing a candidate for president, what would happen? Uh, we have seen the repercussions. We have seen everything uh, that happens in Kenya when you align with one individual or presidential candidate. It's become so bad that if you are involved in politics, you are socially and economically isolated. We saw uh, during especially Uhuru's presidency, which was very vindictive, very toxic, uh, Uhuru ensured that everyone was below him because he wanted to remain as the alpha and omega. And so we have to anchor our economic policies to transcend individual or personal uh, party loyalties and whatever, so that we don't have a situation where we have one singular individual whose only ambition in life is to ensuring everyone else falls so that he can remain on top. Um, uh, that, that was one thing I noticed. I was just trying to juxtapose what was happening there to here. Uh, but then, then we come to why we are in the situation we are in. Who is influencing our policies? Who is deliberately crafting uh, our downfall? Who is making sure that we remain poor, we remain an oppressed people? Uh, number one, I can always say it's the uh, opportunists, the people who have profited from our misery, our collective misery. Is uh, Number one is the foreigners. Personally, I like calling them, please uh, pardon me for my French, I like calling them muzungu pieces of shit. Not the entire race, but the ones who are narcissistic enough to be able or to craft the ideology that only them should prosper and the rest should be below them. So we, 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 we've been talking about capital flight and one of our biggest problem in Kenya is, is that and they have hoodwinked us. For instance, I started hearing of something called the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, since the 80s and then, or, or, or the 90s and the 2000s and they made it look like access for our products to the American market is a privilege. Uh, yet we are good designers, yet we have the raw material, yet we have the expertise to, uh, for instance, when you go to America, you go to one of the Woolworths or, or wh whatever stores, you go Walmart, I don't think they have Woolworths, but you go to Walmart and whatnot, you're going to see jeans, you're going to see clothes which are written made in Kenya. So they've been made in our EPZ factories here in Athi River and whatnot. And they go there just to be labeled, just to be put a brand, if it's uh, Levi Strauss and whatnot. And yet the same can get into the local market. But then they uh, erect entry barriers. Uh, they erect entry barriers for even local entrepreneurs so that uh, our products, which are made with our cotton and with our labor and with our resources, uh, can, go, can access a, a foreign market uh, and we cannot get the same quality here. So it's almost like we are beneath them. It's almost like it's been institutionalized. It's almost like the bureaucratic pieces of shit who work in KRA, who work in Treasury, are conspiring with these foreigners to ensure that we remain as oppressed people. Uh, you, you look at our coffee. Uh, our coffee is diminishing in our, in our production, but the best of our coffee is taken outside the country. And then they go and take just a fraction of it, 10%, and then they mix it with 90% of Brazilian coffee, and then it is imported here as Nescafe, and you idiots are here, you are celebrating that you are drinking coffee, yet it is 10% of the same coffee that your parents and grandparents are growing in their farms. You understand? So we've been... Uh, we, we've been deliberately put in this state, uh, and then and then they they come and scare monga you and tell you uh, uh, build and fashion all these narratives about stability and economic prosperity. But it is them who are prosperous. As we are remaining here consuming third-rate products, while we have the capacity to 
uh, to, to, to build, and uh, one thing we should be focusing on is domestic consumption, value addition, so that when we are exporting something, we are not exporting to a go down in Dubai so that it can be value added and packed and branded. We can do all of that here and create those jobs so that we sell to these Muzungu pieces of shit at the same you know, value, at the same marked up value that they would buy from somebody else. And that is what farmers in Latin America are doing. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it is, uh, you know, and, and, and that contempt, that contempt continues spreading to how we approach our immigration. For instance, in Kenya, uh, any foreigner can land in JKIA and get a visa on arrival. But as we go to the U.S. Embassy, you are queued there. They make us go through hoops. They take our uh, application fees. Uh, they don't even refund, and so, which is why I was saying we should, the other place we should be occupying is occupying U.S. Embassy, because how do they charge $200 for an application? Well, they already have a quota where they know uh, we, we are going to allow these ones. They already have a quota. So today they say we are only allowing 20 or 30. So everyone there, you are just going as a formality because they have pre- uh, they are predecided and predetermined who is going to get a visa and who is going to, who is not going to and then we have seen this Meg Whitman she has been so she has insinuated so uh, herself so much in our policy making she's taking selfies she's doing a lot of PDA with Ruto and I'm saying who the fuck does she think she is she's just a mere diplomat brought here to serve a purpose she's supposed to be neutral she is not even hiding that she is pro this uh, faction of the political device. She doesn't care about Kenyans. She's here serving commercial interests. And we as Kenyans are supposed to clap for her because she, uh, Ruto held an umbrella for her. That is the highest form of contempt. We, we are here because of uh, colonialism. These are the offshoots of colonialism in the 60s and the 70s. And we still find ourselves in uh, the, 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 the age of the Aquarius. We are still complying with such nonsensical PR stance. So if we are saying occupy everywhere, we, are, we also include occupy U.S. Embassy because, number one, they, 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 have been, they have enabled this rogue regime. They have facilitated all these things you're seeing, the murders and the genocide and the massacres in Gedurai and Rongai. But over and above that, they have implemented, because we have a weak Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they have implemented some immigration policy where Kenyans are made to feel as if we are going to beg for visas. You should make those decisions earlier so that if you're not going to give uh, somebody a visa, you're going to, uh, you're going to to refund 75% of the educational or of the applicational uh, applicational fees and I, I think everyone we are on board with that uh, I'm going to touch on something about education uh, we have we are where we are because number one of our media our media is very toxic you have seen how they tried to suppress the numbers of the people in Kware in uh, Mukuru kwa jenga, they were lying blatantly. Linus Kaikai, kai. shame on you if you're listening. You're full of shit, you journalists. Journalists should not be allowed anywhere where we are doing our protests or doing our activities. Because if you're going to take, if you're going to get the real information from the people and then you go and alter it because you've been paid by State House, then you, we, we should not allow you to be there. So journalists are one of one part of the problem. Number two, we have religion. Uh, and number three, we have the educational curriculum. We've been talking about something called the quota system. I've been speaking about it uh, severally. So uh, during the more era, they came up, uh, and during 844, they came up with something called uh, the quota system, where now they select. It's almost like they see. It's almost like they cherry pick the best brains, which will go to some certain schools, which have better facilities than the others. But if you look, and uh, Jimmy was talking about uh, the amount of money that has, uh, you know, we've been we've been expending in the name of debt, uh, we've been collecting. Now this year they've collected two trillion in taxes. They are going to borrow another probably two to three trillion in another uh, in loans, but we are not seeing anything on the ground. The, uh, the the counties are not building anything. So the quota system and we there is this misconception that government the government built alliance school or the government built mangu high school no the schools were started and they were donated by colonialists they were donated by uh, the colonialists because they had grabbed our land now they wanted to make some concessions to hoodwink the people who are stupid by then uh, to be hoodwinked with the church uh, it, it was always the holy 
Trinity. So there was always a church, a school, uh, and a hospital. So they they they, they hoodwink you with that. They they give you that trilogy, and so. Uh, the land was what they was donated, and then they mostly donated it to the church. But the parents who took their children there were always charged a development fee, and that development fee was in every fee structure, and that is what was used to build the schools. Over and above that, there used to be harambees. So there is nobody who can claim that the government has ever built any school. But why do we find ourselves with this so-called capitation? And again, I repeat that you idiots who are saying that Matiangi should be president, you need to understand that they allocated hundreds of billions of shillings over 10 years to go to capitation, money that should have gone to build schools instead. So that instead of converting social amenities like halls into or dining, dining rooms or whatever, instead of converting them into boarding facilities, then we would have uh, expanded the educational facilities and educational access. I gave you another example. Uh, the, we, 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 we have, there is this saying that the closest school is the best school. So instead of having a boarding school where somebody, I saw there is a lady called Karebi who sings and her son got an accident uh, when he was leaving Chavakali, coming back to Nairobi. Why are we subjecting students to these long journeys to go to school? What we should be doing, the closest school is the best school. Like now Nairobi, all the schools were amazing if you look at Upper Hill and whatever, but because subsequent boards, subsequent management, subsequent counties neglected them. So the schools have reduced and fallen in stature and in their quality of education they provide, but they were high-end schools if you look at them today. But uh, even Kibera Olympic, it used, to lead, uh, it used to lead in the KCPE results. So what we need is not now to come up with more entry barriers under the guise of quota system and whatnot. Every county, every CDF, every CDF, Every constituency receives no less than 110 million per year. The cost of building a school is 10 million. Why are we all cramming? We are chasing all of us to go to Mangu, to go to Alliance, to go to where, while we should be concentrating on the amount of money that is stolen in the grassroots. You understand? It's the same thing with hospitals. The cost of building a referral hospital, KU, which was the last one, was 10 billion Kenya shillings. Why uh, is everyone rushing to Nairobi to KNH? Well, these governors are just blowing a lot of money. We've, we already have the numbers. Uh, thankfully, because of uh, the likes of Jimmy Wanjigi, you know, we've been able, I knew there was corruption. Trust me, two years ago, I knew there was corruption. I knew they used to steal money. I just never put it into context, the level at which the theft is perpetrated by the political class until I saw the actual numbers. So these are, this is real. We are, we, we are speaking about people who are repatriating our money, uh, stashing it into foreign accounts. Uh, I was contacted by a group who said that they are the people who are behind... Uh, uh, root or not addressing the Congress, and they said now they are mapping all the uh, bank accounts, foreign bank accounts that are stashing uh, Kenyan proceeds of crime. Uh, those are the same people you celebrate in the country. Uh, those are the same people who, uh, who 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 you who you love and adore and whatever. So back to the the illusion of national schools is that we now need to have national schools in every county. We have already identified that it costs ten to twenty million to build a functional school with every facility. Then we abolish boarding school. Boarding school. Uh, absorbs a lot of resources from parents because they have to invest in bed, they have to invest in uniforms, they have to invest in what? And sleep is not a productive activity. So that we lay more emphasis. First of all, we expand religion from the curriculum. We remove the churches from managing schools so that we, they are run by professional boards. We uh, lay more emphasis on sciences, on uh, on, on, on science, on technology, on agriculture, on sports and arts, so that we can create now a new, so that nobody, we, we cannot have like 100% of our graduates, all of them aspiring to do business administration or to do what? No, we have artists, we have musicians, we have agronomists, we have all, everything. We have even vocational training. Now there's a shortage of, uh, you get somebody to be an electrician for you, uh, they, they are meeting you with a lot of shoddy, uh, 
shoddy work because they haven't perfected the art and it has to start not just in high school but in primary school but you know we've been bogging kids to do a lot of homework carry big bags waking them up i don't know at 5 a.m to go to school that is ra to, ra to learn important subjects which will not even be relevant in their careers in the future while they should start if, if somebody is good in sports, if somebody is good in music, if somebody is good in uh, being a, an electrician or whatnot, they should start in primary school so that they start perfecting the craft earlier in life. So th that is one of the... And then the church has captured, especially our politicians, because our politicians now love uh, masses when they go and address masses and then it comes on TV and then they feel uh, they stroke their bloated egos after saying not, absolutely nothing. So we... Uh, the church can be there, you know, as an oversight. And then religion should be a mandatory undertaking in every school. If, they, if a kid feels they are Christian, nobody should block them. If there is a Muslim, there should be all those facilities in every school. But they should not be driving policy. They should not be adding students to their mental impotence. We have seen the position they have taken in our political dynamics today. We don't trust them. We, don't, uh, we no longer listen to them because they have shown us that given an opportunity, they will be always inclined to identifying and gravitating towards thugs and thieves like William Ruto and Gadi Gashago and whatnot. So we remove them from the, the educational establishment and let's start investing in our youth so that... Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Americ, how, how, how much longer? How much longer? One minute. One minute. Okay. So we re, uh, expand religion from the curriculum because this CBC was an imposition of Fred Matiangi and Uhuru and God knows who else. We don't know when it was, whether there was public participation, but even if there was, we have come to understand that public participation in Kenya is a formality. It's just done you know, for the cameras. But now let's be intentional. Uh, and even as we are talking about overhauling the political and economic structure, let every Every sectoral, uh, every sector contribute in a way you already know the challenges that uh, affect you in your, whether it's in industry, whether it's in agriculture, so that we have one harmonized document to overhaul our uh, economic uh, blueprint so that we build a new one, we build, we anchor it to the constitution so that in future, one president cannot wake up and say, oh, because I hate Jimmy Wajigi, I used to love him, he's my friend, let me go rock up to his house and uh, raid him when his family is there. We don't want to see such scenes again and they will, they will only be a figment of our imagination. There will only be a distant past if our reforms are intentional, if they are deliberate, and if they are forthright, and if we are all committed to the same uh, particular process. Thank you very much, Americ, for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. Um, uh, let me go back to Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, we uh, can we continue the discussion again about yes, the sir. debt? You are talking about the four, the four uh, levels of debt in this country. Yes, uh, Americ, I'm glad to be back. I was saying that we have what you call four pockets of debt. And the four pockets are described this way. The Paris Club pocket. This Paris Club pocket is the pocket that has the Brenton Woods institutions, IMF, World Bank, and a lot of the Western bilateral agreements. We have another, which is called the London Club debt. The London Club debt is where you have euro, 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 euro bond and you have syndicated loans. Very expensive debt. Then you have the Chinese debt. Some of it, uh, most of it, very kosher, but there's been some malfeasance, which I'll explain shortly. It's very soft, but I'll tell you of something that was glaringly a big fraud on Kenyans. And the last pocket is what you call domestic debt. Now, remember what I said earlier, that in the, what is called the medium to long term, our law is very clear, you can only borrow for development. 